Police in Fort St. James are looking for a missing woman. 26-year-old Immaculate Basil was reported missing yesterday. Friends and family last saw her on June 13th. RCMP say she may have been traveling to a cabin near Leo Creek. Mounties are searching a forest service road in that area. Basil was last seen wearing gray yoga pants, white shoes and a black hooded sweatshirt with a maple leaf on the front. Police say they are still in the early stages of the investigation. Anyone with information on Basil is asked to contact Fort St. James RCMP Detachment. On December 8, 1985, Samuel Basil and Patricia Joseph welcomed a baby girl into the world. December 8 is the day of the Roman Catholic Feast of the Immaculate Conception, and the baby would be named Immaculate Mary Basil, known to most as Mackie. Mackie was one of seven, having three brothers and three sisters, and was from the Tlaxcan Nation, British Columbia, based out of Tachi, south of the Kuzchi River. The village of Tachi, inhabited by roughly 400 people, has one road going in, and one road coming out. Patricia Joseph had attended a residential school that was church-run and government-mandated. Children in these schools were stripped of their cultures, traditions and taken away from their families. The last residential school closed in Canada in 1996 and the effects of them are still being felt by many to this day. In her earliest years, Mackie's life was stable this changed when her father had an affair with another woman and left the family. Peter, Mackie's brother, explained that following their father's departure, their mother turned to alcohol and, in his words, kind of just left us behind. Peter began to care for his younger siblings, but before long, the children would be placed in foster care. The three youngest girls, four-year-old Crystal, five-year-old Mackie and six-year-old Ida, bounced around group homes and different foster homes, with mostly non-Indigenous carers. When they were first taken into care, Mackie, Ida and Crystal were initially kept together. Crystal talked about their experiences, saying that the foster parents would just treat us wrong, being in it for the money. If the children got wet from playing outside, then the foster parents would strip them down in public. At some point, Mackie was placed in a separate home, but they would still see each other at school. Due to her thick carrier accent and the outdated outfits the foster carers insisted on putting the children in, they were often targeted by bullies. Mackie and Ida would endure appalling physical, verbal and sexual abuse. They would bear the brunt of it to protect their younger sister, Crystal. Crystal said, All that time they were getting sexually abused by our foster parents to save me. Ida said that Mackie got the most of it. As they got older, they were placed in group homes together, staying in hotel rooms for weeks at a time when a place couldn't be found for them. They would save their allowances and use the money to buy bus tickets or would hitchhike back to the reserve to see Peter, who at that point was too old to be in the foster care system. Because we didn't get to grow up in an indigenous home, Mackie always said she wanted to go back home and get to know our family and get to know the community, Ida said. Ida would later say that their shared experience of the foster care system strengthened their bond and they would make time to call each other regularly at 10am. In the early 2000s, Mackie aged out of the foster care system and graduated from high school. She also remained faithful to her dream of reconnecting with her roots, her heritage and her people. Mackie settled in Fort St James and was working two jobs part-time as a secretary and also as a teaching assistant. In 2006, tragedy would strike when Patricia Joseph was struck by a vehicle in Prince George. She would later die as a result of her injuries. One of the most important aspects of Mackie's life was being a mother to her little boy Jameson. Her world revolved around him and she was a dedicated and devoted parent. Mackie adored children and became a foster parent to some on the reserve. She was determined that children who went into the foster care system would not have the same experiences that she had had, and that the children she cared for would be treated with the dignity and respect that she had been so cruelly denied. Mackie was shy and introverted and highly selective about who she chose to spend her time with. While she struggled, she rarely showed it, determined to overcome her past and not let it define her. 
She didn't drink or do drugs and rarely went to parties or anything of the sort. She preferred to spend her time at home. Any events that came up, Mackie would channel her creative energy and decorate the whole room. Mackie had recently split from her long-time partner, who was the father of her little boy. It is not public knowledge how long they had been together, and the cause of the breakup is also not known. What we do know is that news of their separation had come as a surprise to Mackie's family. In the week leading up to Father's Day, Mackie was with her brother Peter at his home in Tatchy. Following the split with her partner, she would stay there on and off and would keep a bag of clothes in the closet. She seemed troubled, but he didn't think much of it. Whilst they were making coffee, Mackie twice said to him, Promise me, you'll take care of my baby. He responded, Should I be worried? Are you coming back? I'll be back, Mackie promised. A few days later, Mackie, Peter and Peter's wife Vivian went to purchase a cake for Father's Day. As Mackie had lost her ID, Peter purchased two bottles of vodka for a party that she would be attending later that night. Before she headed out, she grabbed her iPod and headphones, Mackie never went anywhere without her music, and promised she would be back the next day as she had plans to take her nephew and son to the park. She returned a few hours later to retrieve the second bottle of vodka before heading up the trail that led out of town. Peter opened the front door, and his sister called back, Goodbye bro, I love you. As Peter watched her walk away, he noticed a man waiting for her further up the trail. Peter later explained in an interview with the Warus, he had asked himself why Mackie would say goodbye in that way if she knew she would be coming home. On the 13th of June 2013 at 5pm, she attended the funeral of her aunt. Later on she went to the house party on the Tatchy Reserve about 20 minutes away from where she lived. It is not public knowledge how many people were at the party or who exactly was there, but Vanessa Joseph, Mackie's cousin, believes that it was mostly Mackie's cousins who were attending the party. At around midnight, she was seen by her brother Peter while she was picking up alcohol and told him she was with her younger cousin Keith and a man named Victor, who was known to Vanessa. Victor was around 48 years old at the time and was known to police and had appeared in the D Slate court for his crimes. His convictions included violent crime and at least one sexual assault. Unusually for her, she didn't have an extra change of clothes or makeup as she normally would for an overnight trip. She also did not own a mobile phone. It was reported that she was wearing a black hoodie with a maple leaf on the front, grey yoga bottoms and white shoes. She also had her dark blue iPod shuffle with her and her white headphones. It is then alleged that Mackie left the party to get some red tin from a hunter's cabin near Kuschi. The truck that she was travelling in allegedly got into an accident as they were coming away from the cabin on Leo Creek Forest Service Road near a place called 16 km. It has been alleged that following the accident she had attempted to hitchhike herself, but this claim has not been substantiated nor corroborated. Vanessa would later say that an accident was apparent as parts of the truck were found near a tree that had been broken in half. She also explained that she had learned that an attempt had been made to get another truck from the hunter's cabin and used that to pull the truck that had crashed. Large portions of the timeline surrounding Mackie's last known movements have not been made public knowledge. We do know that she was alone for much of the night after midnight. From there, no one knows what happened, said Ida. It is also worth noting that around this time Mackie was not driving a vehicle. As 10am rolled around, Mackie was due to have her daily call with her sisters Crystal and Ida, but she failed to answer the phone. Her sisters thought that maybe she was at her brother Nick's house, but there wasn't a phone at his property and they lived too far from him to go and have a look around. Also at 10am, Victor was spotted walking down a street in Tatchy. Noticeably, his clothes were wet up to his chest. He was seen by Vanessa and others. Although at the time they thought it was strange, they weren't aware that Mackie hadn't been seen, so did not investigate further. After learning that the truck Victor had been driving had been involved in an accident the night before, Vanessa said she thought it was odd that Victor would be on foot in town so soon after it allegedly happened. The truck from the cabin had not been driven back to Tatchy, but was instead left on Leo Creek Forest Service Road. No report of the crash was ever filed. When Mackie failed to come home, Ida and Crystal decided to call around those who knew her to see if anyone had seen or heard from her. As time continued to tick by, the next day they discovered she wasn't at her brother Nick's. Mackie had no history of running away, and this behaviour was completely out of character for her. According to a report in The Warus, Victor and Keith told Vivian that Mackie had caught a ride with somebody else. Immaculate Basil had seemingly vanished. 
She went missing from Highway 16. Part of that protracted highway, 724 kilometres of it, is more commonly known as the Highway of Tears corridor. Countless women, mostly indigenous, have vanished from the Highway of Tears or been murdered near it. This was also not the first tragedy of a missing person to strike the family. Mackie's cousin Bonnie Joseph went missing from the Highway of Tears in 2007. She was last seen by her cousin Joanne hitchhiking from Vanderhoof to Prince George. The numbers of missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada is an area of confusion. A 2014 report by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, known as Mounties, said that 1,017 Indigenous women had been murdered between 1980 and 2012, and another 164 were considered missing. However, advocacy groups, including the Native Women's Association of Canada, say that the figure is much higher. In 2014, on the question of a public inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women, the then Prime Minister of Canada Stephen Harper said, it isn't really high on our radar, to be honest. After still no sign of her, on the 17th of June, a missing persons report was filed with the Mounties. The following day, they met with Crystal for the first time regarding her sister and they began to interview people that had been at the party with Mackie to try and ascertain a timeline and start theorising as to what could have happened to her. The community set up a search camp near the bridge where Mackie had last been seen. Around 300 people, including those from neighbouring reserves, mobilised and joined the hunt to find her. Police in Fort St. James are looking for a missing woman. 26-year-old Immaculate Basil was reported missing yesterday. Friends and family last saw her on June 13th. RCMP say she may have been travelling to a cabin near Leo Creek. Mounties are searching a forest service road in that area. Basil was last seen wearing grey yoga pants, white shoes and a black hooded sweatshirt with a maple leaf on the front. Police say they are still in the early stages of the investigation. Anyone with information on Basil is asked to contact Fort St. James RCMP detectives. Attachment. The Mounties received a tip that Mackie had been sighted on the morning of the 14th of June, with the report saying that she had been attempting to hitchhike. The Mounties did investigate these claims, but ultimately determined that the report was false. One problem in coordinating information was caused by her being a resident of one reserve and going missing on another. While they both lay within the Tlazten Nation, they are different jurisdictions. According to the Mounties' report, Victor and Keith stated that they had been travelling in a white truck with Mackie after they had left the party. Keith and Victor both told the Mounties that following the accident, Mackie had separated from them, and press releases from the Mounties also indicated that she had split from the pair shortly after the truck had crashed and become stuck. As part of the investigation, both Victor and Keith were given polygraph tests, and the Mounties reported to Mackie's family that both men had cooperated. Keith and Victor were also interviewed by a forensic psychologist, and in their report to the family, they noted that they had found nothing suspicious after conducting their interviews. It wasn't until after the police interviews on the 18th of June had been concluded that the family learned from the investigating Mounties that Mackie had left the party with Victor and Keith. Mackie's relatives have stated that in the first year after her going missing, they didn't hear much from the Mounties regarding her disappearance and case. For around a week after the 18th of June 2013, the Mounties launched a search effort to try and find her. A hailstorm and rain on the weekend of the 22nd caused problems for the search teams. Various search and rescue organisations, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Air Services, search dogs and the friends and family of Mackie were all out looking for her. The search area was approximately 20 kilometres surrounding Tachi and Kuschi. On the 25th of June, it was reported by Ralph Pierre, chief of the Tlazstem First Nation, that the search area would be extended and they would also begin a search of the Tachi River. Four-wheelers and ground crews continue to search up to half a kilometre into the bush. You know the emotions are running high in the community. A lot of people are tired, but yet their adrenaline kicks in, and everybody just keeps going and going and going, Pierre said. Following Mackie going missing, numerous billboards were erected to bring attention to her case. Posters were put up and newspapers ran articles to try and generate any new leads. The official search for Immaculate Basil was called off in October. 
RCMP have ended their search for a missing Fort St. James woman. 26-year-old Immaculate Basil was last seen by her friends and family on June 13th. It's believed she was traveling to a cabin in the Leo Creek area. Her family reported her missing on June 17th, and a search was underway the following day. An extensive search of the area where she was thought to be was conducted by RCMP and search and rescue groups from Fort St. James, Mackenzie, Burns Lake, Vanderhoof, and along with community volunteers. The search consisted of volunteers on foot, on ATVs, and included the use of an RCMP police dog. A search was also conducted by an RCMP fixed-wing aircraft, RCMP helicopter and a private helicopter. The search area also included the Tachi River with the use of a swift water boat. The investigation is continuing with the assistance of the North District Major Crimes Unit. If you have any information about Immaculate Basil's whereabouts, please contact the Fort St. James RCMP detachment. Despite this, her friends and family continue to scour the area and conduct their own searches. Rumours began to circulate about who could be responsible for Mackie's disappearance. And during a search, Peter and Vivian woke up to find a hole had been slashed in their tent. Locals in town told the family that the truck she had a ride in that night had been found washed out with bleach. But the Mounties said that the police had taken possession of the vehicle and had found no such evidence to back up the claim. They also spoke to her ex-partner and said that he had had an alibi but it was also alleged that he had ducked out of town. When being interviewed by Annie Hilton for the Walrus, the RCMP said they had thoroughly investigated every lead, but as there is no crime scene, nobody can technically be considered a suspect. On the 10th of October 2013, Vanessa Joseph held a walk for her cousin to bring more attention to her case. Before leaving for the walk, Vanessa and others gathered in the Spirit Square with singing and drumming. Children from the Eugene Joseph Elementary School also attended and held signs bringing an awareness to violence against women and also for Mackie. On the third year of Mackie's disappearance, the Tlazden Nation offered a reward of $20,000 for any information that could lead to them finding Mackie after her older brother Paul made the request. Despite this, there have still been no major breaks in the case. Her sister Ida said that three years after Mackie disappeared, all she heard was rumours despite the initial response of the police and them sending out a search and rescue team right away for her. Despite the rumour mill, Ida stated she wanted to know that the police were investigating any possible leads. She also said she was no longer hearing from the police regarding her sister's case and that she hadn't been contacted by them since the year she went missing. There are several theories about what could have happened to Immaculate Basil. As she had a young son and was close to her family, it is considered she unlikely would have upped and left or ran away. RCMP Corporal Dave Tyerman spoke to the Canadian news website, My Prince George Now, about the investigation into Mackie's disappearance. He noted her dedication to her little boy. It would be totally out of character for her to do something like that. Corporal Tyerman also stated, We would be remiss if we didn't think about foul play, so that's being considered. Was she attacked by a wild animal? Was it a part of the terrain? Did she step off a cliff? Other explanations for her disappearance have been considered, including her being involved in an accident. However, had she been involved in an accident, it would be reasonable to presume that she would have been on foot, meaning that had she died by misadventure, it would have been well within the search radius, but no trace of her was found. None of the items that Mackie had with her that night, such as her clothes or iPod, have ever been found. Another theory was that she had been attacked by an animal. Animals in the area include wolves, cougars, grizzly and black bears, and coyotes. This theory is called into question when one considers that no such evidence of an attack was found by those searching on foot and from the air. No blood or remains have ever been found that are confirmed to be hers. The likelihood of it being a stranger abduction could be considered small due to the remote location of the area and the timing. However, the FBI have stated that abductions committed by a stranger most likely involve a firearm and are motivated by sexual assault. Mackie's family is still looking for her and have never stopped. They regularly watch crime shows on investigation discovery to try and gain any ideas for leads. They will continue to search for her until she is found. The only thing I would like to honour my sister is for the people who did it to come forward and give her back to us, Peter said. It's tearing my family apart. Right now, it feels like you're a lost soul yourself. 
just wandering this world. And deep down in your heart, sometimes you do get to the breaking point where sometimes you just want to take things into your own hands and deal with it your own way. But you can't. You just got to keep on trying to find answers. If you have any information relating to the disappearance or whereabouts of Immaculate Basil, please contact the Royal Canadian Mounted Police.